My name is Jonathan Rose. I'm the head of the Department of Political Studies, and I'm uh, thrilled to be able to welcome you here today. Uh, before beginning, I'd like to acknowledge that Queen's is situated on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. And to acknowledge that is to recognize that this territory was occupied long before settlers like me uh, came to live upon it. Uh, it's especially important to make this acknowledgement given our speaker, uh, whose work is really centered around place and space. Uh, so uh, because the, the talk and the speaker and his work is around uh, recognition of arriving in a new land, I think it's appropriate that we recognize the traditional territory. Um, the John Meisel lecture uh, was endowed four years ago. This is the, the pardon me, five years ago. Uh, and this is the fifth iteration of that. Professor Meisel was uh, an illustrious and distinguished professor in the Department of Political Studies. Uh, he was uh, one of the earliest students of political behavior in Canada, wrote about elections, uh, public policy. Uh, he was chair of the CRTC, and he was an active and engaged intellectual and scholar. Uh, and when he retired, he wanted to uh, endow a lecture that would continue that tradition of making connections between the academy and the public. Uh, so uh, uh, this uh, Meisel lecture is really um, a, a result of that. John is 99 years old this year. Uh, he wanted to be here, but was not able to. But uh, he is still eager and will uh, meet our guest speaker, for whom I will say a little more shortly. Uh, so, uh, before introducing our guest speaker, I would like to uh, call to the front Deputy Provost Terry Shield. Thank you, Jonathan, for that introduction. <coughs> Hello, everyone. On behalf of the offices of the principal and the provost, it's my pleasure to welcome you all here for what I'm certain will be a thought-provoking and engaging lecture. To Elamin Abdel Mahmoud, our distinguished speaker, welcome home to your alma mater. Thank we you. are really delighted to have you here. The John Meisel Lecture Series provides an opportunity for the Queen's community to engage with major political issues facing scholars, policymakers, and the public, and encourages the open and respectful exchange and exploration of ideas. I congratulate the Department of Political Studies for hosting this annual event. As educators, we strive to make the university setting one in which students are prompted to challenge their preconceptions and cultivate a deeper sense of curiosity about the world and their place in it. Through lectures such as the one we are about to hear this afternoon, students are encouraged to join their professors and the public in respectful engagement with controversial ideas, thus prompting critical self-reflection and building their capacity to be engaged and reflective citizens. And cultivating strong citizens at the local, national, and global levels is one of Queen's six strategic goals. Queen's has also identified its values, one of which is responsibility. As a community, we believe in collegiality, and we accept our responsibility to build an equitable and inclusive community. Events such as this promote the community that we wish to build. They provide all of us, students, faculty, staff, and members of the Kingston community, an opportunity to pause and critically reflect on the issues that matter to our society and our world. Events such as this make us all better citizens. We cherish these opportunities and I'm very much looking forward to this afternoon's lecture. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you very much for those here. Now I'd like to call uh, Dean Barbara Crump. Right, thank you. Uh, hello, welcome everyone. And it's been a wonderful day today. This morning we had the installation of Justice Sinclair as our chancellor and now we end, uh, I get to end my day listening to you. Um, so I just really think it's important. Uh, John Meisel, a lifelong of learning, 
and uh, Ellen Menz of Abdul Makdus, um, uh, Son of Elsewhere, are two really uh, interesting autobiographies that share much in common. And I also, The Son of Elsewhere, is available for purchase outside of the front <laughs> as well. Um, I strongly urge you to read these biographies and how their histories and experiences have shaped their passions, their critical insights, and practical applications in political communications. It's also wonderful, moreover, for us to have one of our gender studies graduates uh, back here at Queen's, and I really want to extend my thank you to you to how you have given back, and particularly after life after our side. So we're looking forward to your vibe shift and how you will mobilize um, the contentious in the modification of liberal, uh, liberalism. So thank you very much for being here today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dean Crow. Uh, well, let's, I, I don't want to take up too much more time because we've all come here to hear uh, our speaker, but let me just say, uh, building on what you've heard before, that Elamine Abdul Mahmoud uh, exemplifies the very traditions of this lecture. Uh, he has something important to say about a critical issue. Uh, he is a fixture uh, on CBC, for those of you who, like me, are CBC News junkies. He is host of CBC's popular uh, culture show, Pop Chat. He is the founding co-host of the podcast, Party Lines, and is a regular contributor to the National That Issue panel. Uh, Elamine is the culture writer for BuzzFeed News, and uh, his writing has appeared in diverse places like Rolling Stone, uh, The Guardian, The Globe and Mail, uh, and McLean's to name a few. Uh, several people have made mention of the book, Son of Elsewhere, which is really a remarkable, compelling, a nuanced exploration of the immigrant experience here in the limestone city. Um, it is uh, interspersed with discussions of popular culture, uh, music and TV from the early 21st century. So it, uh, for those people who are the same age as Elamine, You'll get, a, you'll get a blast from the past on that. Yeah. Uh, if you haven't picked up a copy, uh, not only should you to understand uh, the role of the immigrant experience in a city like Kingston, but also if you will be like me, amused at the references to things like uh, SNR department store, Copper Penny, <laughs> where Alameen had his first date, uh, Bay Ridge High School, not to mention um, where OPP radar traps are outside of 401. <laughs> But of course, this book is much, much more than a book about Kingston. Uh, it is a testament to the universal truths of belonging and hope. It is an incredibly optimistic book. And the proof of that universal truth lies uh, in the fact that it was featured on the billboards of Manhattan. And I just wanted to post this because that's the dream of every writer <laughs> me right there. Um, to have your book advertised uh, just outside of Penn Station. Yeah, yeah. So those achievements are really uh, obviously very significant. Uh, the Dean and Provost have also uh, alluded to the fact of the greatest achievement of all, uh, and that is Elamine is a graduate of Queen's Arts and Eleven. <laughs> so welcome to the stage and thank you for coming, Elamine. Thank you. Cheers. Hello. This is so nice, so nice to be back in Kingston. Thank you for those generous introductions. Um, feels a little bit like a homecoming, it always does. Um, my dad still lives in town. Um, but also, like, I get an opportunity to give this lecture with a high school teacher here. Hello, Mr. Stewart. Um, this is really exciting and special for me. But also, I'm here to tell you, you made a great mistake. <laughs> Let me just uh, get my notes up and running here, so just one moment. Don't talk amongst yourselves, OK? <laughs> I, uh, I got into campus, and I could immediately tell that the air of midterms is upon us, <laughs> right? Like, no one is smiling. Like, people have other things to do. It's great. It's fantastic. OK. Let me start with here. Does anyone know what this image is? There's like a few people. <laughs> Jim, what is it? You had an option. This is Brian Mulroney, 1984 debate, directed at John Turner. Some say that finger murdered a man, politically speaking. Um, this is the patronage appointments debate. This is Brian Mulroney pointing at John Turner. 
saying, you know what, you could have canceled some of those appointments that your predecessor made. You didn't. You had an option. And I'm here to say to you, you had an option. You had an option in that you could have picked someone illustrious to speak to you today, but you didn't. <laughs> you picked me. And this is going to soon become a problem for you. I'll tell you why. Um, I, uh, who am I? Well, I'm a culture writer for a living. What does that mean? Um, that means that for a living, I get to think about larger cultural issues and how they relate to one another, right? Um, I'm also a professional Taylor Swift fan. Today, the tickets went on sale. Um, I didn't get a chance to get a ticket because Ticketmaster messed up everything. And what you have on the internet today is Swifties meeting the incredible force of antitrust laws. Today, thousands of people are being radicalized into being anti-monopoly because Ticketmaster has a monopoly on how to sell these tickets. That's a culture issue, right? Like it's not just about um, the place where Taylor Swift lives in pop culture or about antitrust laws, which is, we're told, the purview of people who wear ties when they go to work. Um, they, these issues kind of collide into each other and they may become real to one another. Um, I'm very privileged to get to think about those things. I've been a journalist for a decade. Some of this has been written work. Some of this has been radio. Some of it has been this face on TV, but just more speaking. Um, I get to write about anything from Taylor Swift to how masculinity is evolving to uh, the January 6th insurrection. All those things are a part of the stuff that I get to think about. I'm very privileged to get to do this work. And if I did describe what I do, I'd say this. I'm Brad Pitt. <laughs> I'm not Brad Pitt. Uh, this is a still from the, the Citizen Kane of the 21st century. You laugh. The Citizen Kane of the 21st century, which is Moneyball, um, the most important film that has been made in my lifetime. And I mean this because Moneyball is a movie about... No! No, it isn't! Moneyball is a movie that pretends to be about baseball. But it's actually about something much more important. It's about getting on base. No, it's also not about that. Um, I think about Moneyball all the time. It genuinely has been one of the guiding lights of my career. Because it is a movie about revolutions. It's a movie about revolutions and what happens when you're the kind of person who might miss one of them. Right? The central tension is, here's a new idea that threatens to outdo and undo literally everything that Brad Pitt knows about how to do baseball. I literally don't even remember his real name in the movie, and I watched this movie twice a week for the last 10 years. Um, because to me, like, this is a movie about the anxiety of not knowing when a revolution is coming. And I like to start this talk with this point because I'm wondering how many revolutions you've missed. I'll name a few that I missed in my lifetime. I missed Uber. Didn't see that coming. I thought this will pass. I missed Facebook, right? I showed up on this campus September 2005, October 2005. Everyone was like, hey, you should get Facebook. I was like, no. MySpace. I'm, we don't need another thing. Turns out that was a revolution that I missed. What revolutions have you missed? Can someone just name a couple? Like something you just didn't see that taking off. Changing everything about how we live. TikTok, yes. That is a troubling one. It's a big one. I like that all of you thought of it also. Like TikTok. Uh, Tinder was a revolution I didn't see coming, right? Tinder launches 2011. 10 years later, the entirety of how people find each other has changed. That's pretty crazy to me. And so when you watch Moneyball, based on the Michael Lewis book by the same name, it is fundamentally about that tension. It is fundamentally about Brad Pitt, character, uh, being faced with the realization that everything about your work is about to change, maybe. And do you then become that one leper in your community and other baseball managers start to make fun of you and say, you can't do this. It's never going to work. The, the speech that you know, he's given at the end is the first person through the wall always gets their teeth bloodied, and that's true. 
Um, I don't need to go on to more about Moneyball, but here's a revolution I didn't miss. Um, I was born in 1988. Yes, I'm a baby, thank you. So when the Soviet Union fell, I was right there, man. You know, I was three years old, which is to say I was very plugged in to the world. I was ready to discuss all of its implications. I was not. Um, but that doesn't mean that, you know, just because I wasn't there doesn't mean that nobody else was there and deeply engaged in this conversation. In 1992, one year after the Soviet Union fell, Francis Fukuyama took what was once a question and he turned it into a declarative statement. Um, he published The End of History in 1992. What's fun about The End of History, and The Last Man, that book that came out in 1992, is that in 1989, he put out The End of History, which is a question mark. He wasn't sure in 1989. By the time you get to 1992, vibe shifted. Everything's a little bit different. He wrote, we may be witnessing the universal universalization of liberal Western democracy, which some people may have looked at, you know, and you know what, thought, that's probably going to look like this. This is I'd like to buy the world a Coke commercial. There was an assumption that there was now an ethos that was going to be pervasive all over the world, right? But for me, it looked like this. This is the Al Shifa pharmaceutical factory in Sudan. It was bombed August 20th, 1998. I was 10 years old when that happened. Um, it opened in July of 1997. It was bombed a year and one month later. That's pretty remarkable because as a nine-year-old, I remember when this factory opened, there was a massive celebration. The celebration was we, as a nation, Sudan, could finally make our own malaria medicine. In the span of about a year, this is a factory that went on to make 90% of the aspirin consumed in Sudan, 70% of the malaria medicine that was consumed in Sudan. The years preceding that, Sudan was beholden to other nations for aid. Um, we finally had something that was ours. And then in 1998, um, I woke up in the middle of the night because Tomahawk muscles, missiles rather, um, will light up the night. They have a way of sort of creating enough light that you're like, oh, I'm awake now, thank you. Uh, everyone around us lost power. Um, I remember piling into the one house next door, the neighbor's house, and we waited to find out on the news what is going on. And the answer was Bill Clinton, looking very kind of surly, came on our TVs and said, as I'm saying these words, um, our missiles have targeted a weapons of mass destruction factory in Sudan. Uh, there's never been any evidence of that. There's never been any evidence that that factory made anything other than pharmaceutical, um, that pharmaceutical products, uh, the aspirin and the like. Uh, but one thing that you learn in that moment, right, is that America, and by extension the West, saw itself as a, as a police force of the world. It was in a position to do so. There's a, there's a liminality, there's a sort of fragility and precarity to being in the global south. And when you look at America, um, it seemed like this was the place to be, right? Because here is what it had to offer. It had a structure that was permanent, that was stable, that was unassailable, that was, could not be defeated, right? There's a robustness to this. There's a sense of optimism. There's a sense of safety. There's a sense of, I don't know, this, the Macarena, <laughs> right? Like, people here could do that. We couldn't do that in Sudan. We tried to, right? It's a little bit hard to concentrate when your nation becomes targeted um, by America. But more importantly, at that point, the West had graduated into um, being at war not with nations, right? Suddenly the rage was being at war with concepts. You could be on war, you could be at war with poverty, right? You could be at war, war on drugs. Um, those were the kinds of wars, the war on terror. These are the kinds of wars that the West could kind of concern itself with. And sure beats going to war with another nation. This in very tiny print, says risk society. I don't know if you can see it here. Uh, but two years before I was born, 
um, the influential German sociologist Ulrich Beck introduced the concept of risk society. And what he was railing against is, um, is this, right? He was railing, we'll get to this. He was railing against, in the preface, he sort of rails um, against the concept of post, the post prefix, right? Everything was post-war. You got there. Don't get there. Let me get there. Everything was post-war, post-industrial, post-modern, post-Malone. This is the only reason this slide is here. <laughs> this is post-Malone, in case that's not clear. Um, yeah, Beck was not writing about post-Malone. But instead, what Beck was trying to name was that actually this notion of post isn't good enough, right? It's not good enough because it doesn't actually tell you the thing that you're defining yourself against. So he wanted to name a sense of unsettledness that people were experiencing in the 80s when the world was still a sort of bipolar world. This vague sense of anxiety that, you know what? You wake up in the morning and you say, howdy neighbor, what's the chance of nuclear war today? And the concept that he came up with was this concept of risk society, which is that we are organizing ourselves in accordance to risk, in accordance to how we respond to global, anonymous, invisible threats. There's a, you know, a robust society is one that can deal with risks effectively. I cannot believe I said all of that with Post Malone behind me. <laughs> Why didn't no one tell me? Sometime between when Beck wrote Risk Society and when he was translated into English, the world changed. He wrote it in 1980, published in 1986, it was translated in 1992. Um, so suddenly we have the shift, right? We've gone from a universe of a chance of nuclear threats to the universe of the Coke commercial. Uh, that's, a, that's a large departure, right? Hard to see the global threats when you're, when you're doing one of these. This is the Macarena. <laughs> And what I want to submit to you today is that we are very much at the mouth of the volcano that he writes about, right? The question that he poses is how can we live on the volcano of civilization without deliberately forgetting about it, but also without suffocating on the fears? And this is where we are now. In the span of two years, we have been seeing the foundation of all of our political relationships um, on every level, whether it's the interpersonal to the international, they get exposed as in a state of, a profound state of disrepair. Interpersonally, we found that the COVID-19 pandemic has kind of created rifts that we didn't anticipate, right? That are not repairable anytime soon between masked and unmasked, between vaccinated and unvaccinated, between tolerant and intolerant. And these are natural rifts, natural rifts I think, to a certain extent. But they've been made worse. Um, they may have been made worse by many of the institutions we trusted not to make them worse. We've seen politicians try to use them in a very deliberate way. Um, that's alarming to us, or at least it should be alarming to us, because that's not what we have politicians for, but it's become a bit of a shorthand for them to just get there, right? But also with our relationships with our friends, we've seen that our lives as political beings have been our lives as political beings have been reordered a little bit. I don't know how many of us haven't had that kind of sense that your relationship with a bunch of close friends has changed over the last couple of years just because you have a different kind of risk tolerance than they do. You have a different kind of um, political orientation than, than they do when it comes to, hey, what does it mean to protect the people around me? What does it mean not to protect the people around me? And we're imbuing all of these things with really harsh political meanings that end up causing or making the rifts between us much worse in a way. So how we relate to each other has changed. You know what, I feel bad. I, we need to have a, a fun slide. I'm sorry for not having a fun slide for a while. Uh, nationally, we've been seeing the fraying of a lot of institutions. Some of them have been declining for some time. We're not reinventing the wheel here, like the church has been an institution that's been declining in its role in public life, for example, for some time. But then other institutions like work uh, have gone a massive change in just two years. Our relationship to work may never go back to the way that it was. I have a five-year-old daughter. Um, 
her notion of work is, well, you just sit in the living room and then you just sit on your computer and then whenever I want stuff, I get it. Um, that's, that's not how it works, right? Um, but it's going to be difficult to reintroduce some of those ideas and some of those relationships that we had with work again. Um, it will forever be remarkable, I think, to me, but also to a lot of people who are interested in politics, that we had a federal government that was able to get billions of dollars out the door in a matter of weeks, right? The machinery of government, the stuff that we talk about all the time, is like, it's too slow, right? We don't know how to do that. We don't know how the government can respond to crises like this. And then it was how long between the, the total shutdown of the economy and the first CERB checks? It was three and a half weeks. That's genuinely remarkable, right? It tells us a lot about the machinery of government that we misunderstood, but it also resets the expectations that we had from government. Suddenly, when we find ourselves in different crises, we say, well, there was that one time that you guys were able to get billions of dollars into people's bank accounts in a matter of weeks. So you're telling me that you can't respond to this crisis now? I think you can. It's just, it just does not seem to be as big a priority for you as what we were going through in March of 2020. I think that's remarkable. I also think that we've had a stretch of time of political leaders who have been seeking office and their entire platform for seeking the office has been them just spending time outlining the ways in which they seek to undermine the institutions that they want to lead. That's new for us, I think, right? Not that we haven't had, you know, um, iconoclastic politicians before, of course we have, but the idea that someone wants to lead an institution and their very proposition is that actually this institution shouldn't exist. That's something that we're going to be unpacking for some time. Um, that's also new for us. Internationally, the weeks, bef the weeks after uh, the invasion of Ukraine were probably among the most surreal in my life. Um, not that I haven't seen a war. I'm the generation that watched the Iraq war unfold on TV. Um, probably when we were young, too young to do that parents in the room. Maybe you should have turned off the TV, okay? I'm not taking responsibility for that one. But I think what made watching the invasion of Ukraine different was President Zelensky, right? You had in Zelensky a leader who so brilliantly spoke the language of the West, the language of the end of history, the language and the recognition of the supremacy of Western democracy. Speech after impassioned speech, you had a leader that said, you know what, you have been trying to tell us about your values and we align ourselves with your values. Will you have us? Will you protect us? And the West said, sort of. Uh, which introduces, I think, a larger problem, which is that it turns out in the 30 years since the fall of the Soviet Union, liberalism has kind of come to be taken for granted a little bit. The will to defend it has withered. We don't really know what it means to even defend it. We've come to be organized like this because, well, because, because practice, right? Because inertia, not because there's been some kind of reinvigorating case to be made for the society we exist in now, the way that we do things now. It's just kind of been the thing that we've been doing. I think about this image way too often, okay? I think about this image every day. Um, for those of you who can't see it, it, it's a, it is a forest fire. And then uh, the sign says, senior center, wear a mask, wash your hands, social distance, stay safe. Um, it was a really striking image. It was one of the images of the year um, of 2020. I don't, I don't know what to tell you. I don't know what to tell you. It feels like there's been a significant shift in our relationship to institutions, to each other. Uh, the economist Adam Tews brought back into fashion an apt word that was used before, but um, it seems to have had a new life, right? And this new life is, is the, the word is the polycrisis. Um, it's, not, it's not fancy, it's a bit on the nose, right? It's like you have a crisis, you have a bunch of crises, and they're all intersecting with each other. But there's something powerful um, about him reintroducing that word because that's what it feels like. It feels like we're existing this moment 
um, where crises are congealing into one. Several crises are congealing into one. The energy crisis is a food crisis, is the inflation crisis, is the social safety net crisis, is also the runaway capitalism crisis, is the climate crisis, is the political distress crisis. All of these crises um, seem to be congealing into one and you don't really know where to look. There's a sense of political and social exhaustion with knowing where the problems are coming from and what to do with these problems. It feels like the dam is breaking, but I, I have no answer for you on how to reinforce it, except this. This is a sentence from Tim Snyder's book. The sentence is, there's a difference between memory, the impressions we are given, and history, the connections we work to make if we wish. Um, the, the, the book is called The Politics of, in of Inevitability. Uh, and he takes the task of kind of, you know, um, when we think about institutions that are just going to hold up because they're going to hold up, um, he takes that thinking to task. He says, there's nothing inevitable about the way that we've organized ourselves. And we've come to take it for granted and it's become really easy for us to take it for granted. Uh, the notion that a certain kind of history will just kind of arrive, inevitably so, without us having to articulate it, um, that's what the sentence is trying to deconstruct, right? It's time to recognize that our lives at that mouth of the volcano, um, it, it means we have to be active participants in that as opposed to merely sort of, you know, going along with it. And I'm generally not a bleak person by nature. Um, I have had to do a lot of rethinking and reorganizing of my relationship to politics, but also how I understand other people to understand politics. A good example of this um, has just been this week um, and the conversation around mask mandates in this province, right? Um, the accepted political wisdom was that we're not going to go back down that well again, right? After several years of being exhausted by mass mandates, it's unlikely that they will return. Well, it turns out that actually when every children's hospital is overrun, um, there is no other option. There is no other option. This thing is going to force your hand. That's, uh, that's a hard realization. It's a hard realization to sort of be at the whims of history in this way. But uh, all, if all of this is hard for you, I think, like, stick with me. Because as I said at the beginning of this lecture, you know, you have an option. Um, there's, a sense of, there's a sense of engagement that you are owed. There's a sense of engagement that you owe the world. Um, and the notion of not being a part of these conversations, I think, is frustrating to me. And that's what I wanted to speak about today. Thank you. Thanks so much.